uh, good evening one and all uh, on behalf of issbd i welcome you all to this issbd master class on lymphadenopathy diagnostics approach by none other dr uh, pankaj malhotra who is the professor and head of department of clinical hematology and medical oncology pgi chandigarh on behalf of uh, the team i would like i, I take the honor in inviting dr professor um, uh, dr pankaj malhotra who is the head of the clinical hematology department he is also the president of image group and the member of board of directors international myeloma society he has received uh, several awards of these are the icmr award for young scientist to mayo clinic from usa and cml fellowship from usa he is a member of several societies and he has more than 500 publications in several journals he has supervised more than 100 thesis students and uh, more than 100 presentations in several conferences we are very glad to have him for this talk and today's talk will be on lymphadenopathy diagnosis so uh, lymphadenopathy as a general introduction i would like to say that lymphadenopathy is a common encounter for a clinician in an opd and uh, there are uh, so sometimes the cause for the lymph node is apparent like the benign or some infectious cause that can be apparent from the uri you get a submandibular lymph node or sometimes it may not be an apparent cause it may be a manifestation of an internal malignancy or a systemic cause so it, it it's it's not always easy for a lymph lymph node to manifest as a or you can diagnose something from the lymph node it can be limited it can be generalized it can be the size matters sometimes the site matters sometimes what site is involved so each thing has its peculiar characteristics so as a clinician how dr pankaj would like to tell us about the approach to a lymphadenopathy in a clinical setting and uh, we, we are very excited to hear it from you sir over to you sir uh thank you pavin uh, and uh, thank you for this uh, introduction i think you have uh, made my task little bit easy by uh, this introduction uh, so what i am going to do is to uh, uh the the topic uh, which is given to me is diagnostic approach to lymphadenopathy but obviously i am going to discuss little bit about the uh management part of it also uh sorry okay. yeah so uh, today is uh, actually guru puri uh, purnima so i would first like to uh, pray my uh, uh, thoughts to uh, my gurus who have taught me uh, all the hematology and all the medicine which i am uh, you know sharing with you people so the topic is lymphadenopathy diagnostic approach and to just start uh, with this uh, talk uh, I, i just to get a feel of uh, you know what uh, actually we encounter in the clinical practice i would start to share some cases with you uh, so this is uh, the runners up kind of a thing uh, to the to the main talk so 24 years old male who has noted a cervical lymphadenopathy of a month duration he also has low grade fever for one month now he comes to to you in the opd there is also history of loss of appetite and when you are taking the history you also get the history of exposure to active pulmonary tuberculosis uh, uh, in his uh, uh, father case number 2 a 24 years old uh, young male was getting a pre job joining medical checkup and as a part of uh, routine checkup he also underwent a chest x ray which showed bilateral hyler lymphadenopathy however he is totally asymptomatic case number 3 a 35 years old male truck driver who is unmarried he noted generalized lymphadenopathy for the last 3 months of duration however there is no history of fever he also has loose motions on and off and some weight loss uh, uh, which he could not quantify but he did tell loosening of clothes for a month duration case number 4 a 56 years old uh, male who is a chronic smoker he presented with significant uh, weight loss of 3 months uh, duration and on examination there was a single lymph node in the left supraclavicular region case number 5 a 65 years old female who presented with generalized lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly 
and there was significant history of pruritus and night sweats so all these cases uh, have prominent findings of uh, lymphadenopathy now lymphadenopathy sometimes as such is not a, a disease or a disorder it's like you know you have somebody comes to you with a fever and then you have to find out the cause of fever similarly here if somebody has come with lymph node lymphadenopathy so you have to find out the cause for that so when you look at the uh, causes of uh, lymph node enlargement you can grossly divide them into either they are infective or malignancy autoimmune disorders hydrogenic and miscellaneous so these are the broad five uh, group of uh, uh, five groups where uh, you know once you are taking the history and doing the examination you have to broadly try to fit the uh, lymphadenopathy into these categories infection for example uh, if you think of infection then you also have to think of whether it is uh, you are thinking of a bacterial infection viral infection or a parasitic infection malignancies whether it is a hematological malignancy or other solid uh, tumor malignancies autoimmune disorders like sarcoidosis sle rheumatoid arthritis dermatomyositis hydrogenic mostly due to the drugs and miscellaneous or sometimes we call as atypical lymphoproliferative disorders like kikuchi kimura rhizoid of man kesselman and so many others uh you can also actually uh, if you want to remember for uh, any of the exams uh, you can remember by the mnemonics miami m for malignancies i for infections a for autoimmune disorders m again for miscellaneous or unusual conditions and i for hydrogenics so uh, in the previous slide whatever uh, um, uh, few diseases which i have mentioned you you can group into these so what is the approach to diagnosis of lymphadenopathy so you would find two situations one is the patient who has presented with lymphadenopathy or he himself has noted an enlargement of the lymph node and he has come to you for the to find out the cause of this lymph node on the other hand you also have somebody who has presented with let's say fever and weight loss and on examination you find there is a presence of lymphadenopathy so whenever you are making a diagnosis the history and physical examination actually will give you the clue most of the time so if you take a good history and do you do a good physical examination you will you will be able to reach uh, uh, uh close to the diagnosis for example in the case one uh, a 24 year old male who has noted a cervical lymphadenopathy and low grade fever loss of appetite so the clue is that there is a history of exposure to active pulmonary tuberculosis in the family so this is you know again from the history so you 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 can think of possibly this is you are dealing with infection and likely to be mycobacterial infection 24 or real who was getting a pre job joining medical checkup bilateral hyra lymphadenopathy and he is totally asymptomatic no systemic symptoms so this is a clue that totally asymptomatic uh, lymphadenopathy so what could be the causes case 3 a 35 year old male truck driver and unmarried so somebody who is driving the truck and who is unmarried you know what is the likely diagnosis uh, in this patient so again a clue from the history or from the profession of the patient <clears throat> case 4 male chronic smoker so here the clues are is a chronic smoker and we know the smokers have higher incidence of uh, malignancies not only of the lungs but of the other organs also and he has a lymph node in the left supraclavicular region which is again uh, from your mbbs knowledge you know that it is a most likely malignancy so what are the risk factor for malignancy generally you would consider malignancy in somebody who is older than 40 years the duration of lymphadenopathy which is greater than 4 to 6 weeks and uh, at least for lymphoproliferative disorders you have generalized lymphadenopathy male sex node which is not returned to baseline within 2 to 3 months supraclavicular location as i said Uh, in the previous slide and somebody who has systemic uh, signs and symptoms like fever night sweat weight loss pedospinomegaly 
and the last case was a female who had generalized lymphadenopathy so here the clue is of hepatosplenomegaly in addition to lymphadenopathy and presence of night sweats so the history questions uh, 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 when you are looking at this patient you also have to uh, ask whether it is localized or generalized lymphadenopathy what is the history of drugs or medication uh, we discussed that it is an important cause of uh, lymphadenopathy and what are the drugs or medication so they can you know somebody whose uric acid is high and is on allopurinol uh anti hypertensive drugs like atinolol captopril anti epileptic like carbamazepine penicillin groups phenytoin uh, quinidine uh, sulfa drugs so all these uh, some of these drugs are commonly used so obviously uh, if the patient has is taking these drugs and he has a lymph node which is asymptomatic small lymph node then obviously and if you are not able to find out any other cause then you you would attribute this to the possibility to these drugs then uh, fever is a very important uh, symptom a low grade or high grade what is the duration of fever whether it is a short duration or a long duration obviously a short duration high grade fever you would think of infectious possibility like infectious mononucleosis or so long duration fever you would think of tuberculosis or so sometimes low grade fever uh, can also be present in autoimmune disorders like sle then whether there are any additional symptoms of anemia thrombocytopenia uh, along with lymphadenopathy which basically means that you are thinking of a lymphoproliferative disorder or a hematological malignancies recurrent infections along with lymphadenopathy many times it can be autoimmune uh, or immunodeficiency uh, disorders who can present with these then if it is a localized lymphadenopathy then local wound or trauma especially in a diabetic patient can have a uh, lymph node enlargement so what are the clues and initial testing to de determine the cause of lymphadenopathy so this is just the summary uh, what i have presented in the previous slide so somebody who has come with fever night sweat weight loss or node located in supraclavicular popliteal or iliac region so obviously you will think of either hematological malignancies or a solid tumor malignancy fever chills sore throat nausea vomiting diarrhea so mostly it is bacterial viral pharyngitis hepatitis influenza infectious mononucleosis especially in the young patients is quite common and sometimes tuberculosis high risk sexual behavior shankarad hiv infection lymphogranuloma venereum syphilis and if there is a, a exposure to the animals or food uh, contact cats cat scratch disease toxoplasmosis then sheep or uh, uh, cattle wool anthrax brucellosis these are quite common undercooked meat anthrax brucellosis toxoplasmosis then there is a if there is a history of recent travel to some in, uh, endemic area or there are insect bites then it is the diagnosis based on the endemic region somebody who has come with arthralgia rash joint uh, stiffness fever chills muscle weakness then obviously it is likely to be an autoimmune disorder now after the history uh, which will give you a clue uh, you go to the examination findings and when you are uh, examining obviously you are going to examine the presence of lymph nodes uh, because this all talk is about the lymph nodes so it is very important to know the drainage of each group of lymph node for example uh, mostly you know um, almost in the clinic you will see 50 to 60% of patients will come with cervical lymph node enlargement so it if it is you know supraclavicular on the right side then the drainage is from the mediastinum and lungs on the left side it is the abdomen uh we are going more detail on the uh, cervical region so <clears throat> pre auricular nodes drainage is from the scalp and skin the differential diagnosis obviously scalp infections or mycobacterial infection and sometimes the malignancies uh, uh, which can be varied posterior cervical nodes drainage is again scalp neck upper thoracic uh, skin the differential diagnosis remains the same then supraclavicular uh, nodes drainage is the gi tract and the pulmonary and the mediastinum 
and the malignancies can be mostly pulmonary or uh, even abdominal also some mandibular nodes drainage is from the mostly from the oral cavity and these are sometimes uh, uh, enlarged uh, quite commonly uh, in young patients however there in an older patient it can be a malignancies of the head and neck region then the anterior cervical nodes they drain the larynx tongue oropharynx and anterior neck and the differential diagnosis remains the same as in the submandibular nodes so then uh, delto pectoral uh, lymph nodes mostly drainage is from the arms in the axillary, axillary area it is the arm breast thorax and neck and the epitrochlear is an important uh, group of lymph nodes medial side of the arm and below elbow so when you talk about uh, axillary nodes again as i said in the previous slide breast upper extremity thoracic wall the differential diagnosis uh, would vary from the infections to uh, sporotrichosis sarcoidosis syphilis leprosy brucellosis leishmaniasis and malignancies depending upon the other uh, uh, findings on physical examination epitrochal nodes the drainage is uh, uh, from the ulnar uh, forearm hand and skin infections lymphomas or skin malignancies are the common so mostly if you are able to palpate the epitrochlear nodes it is generally always abnormal infraclavicular nodes again differential diagnosis uh, uh, goes for the presence of lymphoma then drainage area of the inguinal region mostly lower extremities genitalia buttock and abdominal wall below the umbilicus and the popliteal uh, which very rarely uh, you know the clinician feel in the clinic but it is an important lymph node so uh, differential diagnosis again from behind reactive lymphadenopathy why because uh, you know inguinal lymph nodes as such are quite uh, common finding uh, even in otherwise uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, person but uh, obviously depending upon the situation you can have lymphomas squamous cell uh, carcinoma of penis vulva ns skin neoplasms or so so uh, the other thing is when you are uh, palpating the lymphadenopathy what is the size of the lymph node and most of the time as a general rule you can remember more than 1 cm of uh, size of lymph nodes are abnormal uh, however it also depends on the location so somebody who has a supraclavicular lymph node popliteal epitrochlear even if the size is less than 1 cm they are considered as abnormal whereas uh, inguinal lymph nodes even if they are uh, 1.5 cm up to 1.5 cm they can be considered as normal so again you know it all depends on your clinical situation a lot of uh, uh, other findings and history uh, but this as a thumb rule you can remember the or based on this size then the consistency is if it is a soft likely to be reactive infections autoimmune disorders if it is hard then likely to be malignancy uh, then whether it is localized when you know it is localized only to the one area right cervical area or left cervical area then mostly it is the local infection scalp or inguinal region generalized it is a systemic process and generally patient will have some systemic symptoms in the form of fever weight loss night sweat pruritus etc then the other thing which you or while uh, examination you uh, uh, feel is whether these are matted uh, or conglomerate kind of a group of lymph nodes which basically means that the pathology which is present in one node has now moved to the other nodes because of the inflammation uh, of the capsule and uh, that's why there is a uh, joining of the lymph nodes together and matted lymph nodes can be present in various uh, uh, disorders from infections to lymphoproliferative disorders and if they are discrete that means at least the inflammation has not gone to the other lymph node then shape which is very difficult to uh, uh, you know when you are palpating the lymph nodes difficult to decipher unless it is a small lymph node so mostly the lymph nodes are kidney shape or bean shape but if they become circular or round then obviously that that is the first sometimes the abnormality uh, uh, if you pick up and mostly clinical examination it is very difficult to pick up but yes on ultrasound if you pick up uh, uh, that abnormality that means there is definitely 
some pathology which is going on inside the body. Then few other findings which are important to note is like overlying erythema, tenderness, mobility, whether it is fixed to the overlying skin or underlying structure, painful or not. This will all give you clue towards the uh, presence of some disorders. So after history and examination, once we have done the history and examination, then obviously you will reach a differential diagnosis of this uh, lymphadenopathy, which uh, and based on the history and examination, you will try to fit into the broad categories of infection, autoimmune disorders or malignancy. And then the, you go to the investigations. And the most important test for any lymphadenopathy is fine needle aspiration cytology. However, uh, so fine needle aspiration cytology will either give you the diagnosis or it will triage. Triage basically means that it will give you the direction whether you want to go for uh, core biopsy or excision biopsy or any other investigation uh, to find out the cause of uh, this enlarged lymph nodes. The FNAC is very easy, safe and minimally invasive and that's why uh, you, you know that is the almost as the first choice in most of the patients. However, uh, before you do the FNSC, uh, look at the CBC. And I would just quote case number five here, uh, the 65 year old female who presented with general, generalized lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly, significant history of pruritus and night sweats. So one is there is a generalized lymphadenopathy, you can do an FNSC. But if you look at the CBC, the CBC showed uh, uh, anemia and very high WBC count with lymphocyte predominant, 90% lympho lymphocytes. So if there are 90% lymphocytes, the WBC is high, uh, all hematologists would know that this patient requires a flow and CD5, CD23 positive, which was suggestive of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. In chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you may not do the FNSC of the lymph nodes because the diagnosis is confirmed. However, I, I would again here uh, caution you the importance of history. And the, in this patient, the history is of significant weight loss and night sweats, which are uncommon in a garden variety of a CLL. So that means an excision biopsy may still be required, required to rule out Richter transmission. So again, you know, it depends on your clinical acumen. So you see as many patients as possible and based on that, you develop an experience and then you can take a decision in the clinic. So the investigations which are generally done for patient who present with the lymphadenopathy is CBC, you want to look at the liver function test, uh, renal function test, fasting plasma glucose, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, uric acid, then as I said, FNSC or a core biopsy, excision biopsy, depending upon the situation. Then autoimmune markers like ANA rheumatoid factors, ACE levels, and other uh, autoimmune workup, chest X-ray. And then a CT scan or a PET CT scan, depending upon the your differential diagnosis. One word uh, about the core biopsy and excision biopsy. So after FNC, which is a very easy and minimally invasive test. So if you give if if it is gives you the diagnosis, it is okay. But many times for lymphoproliferative disorders, you have to consider doing an excision biopsy for at least for lymphoma. But some people prefer a core biopsy, especially if the low lymph node size is quite large and uh, it is difficult to excise, then people prefer a core biopsy. So core biopsy is basically using a biopsy gun, uh, which is useful for large lymph nodes or uh, nodes which are inaccessible, like abdominal lymph nodes, and there is no peripheral lymphadenopathy. But uh, you can still miss the pathology if you are not hit the pathology properly. Whereas excision biopsy is a surgical procedure uh, uh, so you have to involve a surgeon um, or unless you are expert in the uh, excision biopsy of the lymph node, you have to do, give a local anesthesia and they are difficult on large node, but the excision biopsy gold standard at it gives you the complete architecture of the lymph node, especially for lymphoma patients. Always remember that excision biopsy is the gold standard. Then if the patient has generalized lymph node how do you choose a target lymph node or how do you choose which lymph node to biopsy? And uh, mostly you choose the cervical region and especially if it is supraclavicular, then prefer to choose supraclavicular or the cervical region because they have the highest yield. Whereas inguinal have lowest yield, 
even if the size is more than 1.5 cm so so try to remember this as a as a general rule and if a pet ct scan is available then uh, you prefer a lymph node who, which has the highest suv value and for that sometimes you do can do a pet ct guided biopsy of that lymph node so again coming back to the clues and initial testing to de determine the cause of lymphadenopathy so so the historical clues of fever night sweat suggested diagnosis were this so what test test you would do so you would do cbc biopsy bone marrow biopsy imaging with ct scans then somebody who had a short duration of fever chills malaise sore throat limited illness may not require any additional testing depending upon the clinical assessment consider cbc mono spot test liver function test cultures high risk sexual behavior hiv or uh, the other tests for the sexually transmitted um, uh, diseases then if it is a insect or animal exposure then cat scratch anthrax brucellosis mostly you do the serology or these days pcrs are available then recent travels then based on the endemic region you will do the serology or pcr as, as uh, required somebody who has come with arthralgia and here you will do the autoimmune markers like ana dst na and other things so uh, so how do you finally uh, uh, you know approach so so this is just an algorithm which i have taken from the this american family physician so uh i actually could not get a good algorithm and i i wanted to make on but you know this is such a non specific kind of a thing it's very difficult to make uh, uh an algorithm but still uh you know based on the history exposures and all those and and uh, physical examination as has been said in the previous uh, slides so you will try to uh, group into the four categories like you know benign or self limited autoimmune disorders malignancy or unexplained so diagnosis diagnostic of benign or self limited disease treatable yes treat appropriately no reach your and explain the expected course of uh, disease and continuously follow up this patient autoimmune disorder uh, obviously you have to treat uh, uh, for the autoimmunity but sometimes you know autoimmune disorders can have additional uh, problem also because these patients are prone for infections also so you have to might have to do additional test if it is a kind of a malignancy uh, then uh, if it is a solid cancer malignancy then fnc is sufficient but if you are thinking of hemat malignancies then excision biopsy uh, try to do the excision and biopsy of the lymph node and uh, in many situation it is unexplained then based on the uh, specific testing you can give empiric treatment uh, or you review the risk factor for malignancies and depending upon uh, you know the situation you do the appropriate uh, test uh, again you know it is the clinical acumen so even though this algorithm i got from uh, american family physician but i am still not very happy it just gives you the uh, you know just gives you the direction so finally in the clinic you have to make your own algorithm based on the place wherever you are uh, doing the practice so we come back to our uh, initial cases uh, the first case was 24 years old male who noticed cervical lymphadenopathy low grade fever and he had history of exposure to active pulmonary tuberculosis in the family so the fnsc of the lymph node was done which showed caseous necrosis granulomatous inflammation and afp was positive and uh, the fine and the gene expert was also sent which was positive so final diagnosis was tubercular lymphadenopathy and this patient was referred to dot center for att for the second case uh, who was getting a routine checkup and chest x ray shows bilateral hyalur lymph node neuropathy was asymptomatic so his ace levels were sent which were uh, higher than the normal range and he agreed for bronchoscopy and tblb uh, and there was granulomatous inflammation 
so the diagnosis and there was no causation so diagnosis of sarcoidosis was missed the other differential diagnosis of uh, uh, lymphadenopathy sometimes uh, you know if you are sitting in the hematology clinic can be a lymphoma also uh, and that's why it is important to do uh, lymph node uh, at least aspiration or biopsy case 3 our male truck driver who was unmarried noted generalized lymphadenopathy and uh, in this patient uh, as expected hiv test was positive cd4 count was only 100 however when the fnsc was done that showed granulomatous inflammation consistent with tuberculosis so that this patient has aids uh, and, and disseminated tuberculosis Case four, a 56 years male chronic smoker who presented with the significant weight loss and finding of single lymph node in the left supraclavicular region. So FNSC of the lymph node showed adenocarcinoma, upper GI endoscopy was done, which showed malignant ulcer in the stomach, which was the cause of appetite and weight loss in this patient. So final diagnosis was adenocy of the stomach. And the fifth case uh, I have <clears throat> already uh, explained to you that the counts were very high and this was lymphocytic predominant and this was CLL right 3 binet B I think because there was no thrombocytopenia. So finally uh, conclusions, uh, lymphadenopathy is uh, mostly manifestation of an underlying disease process. The history and physical examination will give you the direction towards the diagnosis. The investigations are done to confirm the diagnosis and the treatment consists of underlying disease. With that, I thank you very much for your kind attention and would be happy to take the questions. Thank you very much, sir, for this excellent presentation. Um, I have the pleasure and, and I, I have the pleasure to listen to Professor uh, Malotra's talks since years and years and I'm listening and I'll be listening to your talks in the futures also. And uh, I, I really enjoy your uh, case-based approach and uh, things like that. And I'm, de I'm definitely sure that uh, that uh, the participants who have attended the sessions also enjoyed your case-based approach rather than a generalized talk. Thank you very much for that, sir. Thank and uh, uh, and uh, through your vast experience, uh, we could learn several of these uh, important aspects of how to approach a particular case of uh, lymphadenopathy. To summarize, sir, I would like to say that, uh, please correct me if I am any anywhere. So I would like to say that uh, history, physical examination, personal examination, or personal history, occupational histories, these are very important while applying any case. You, you say it as a lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, whatever it is. All these are baseline things that you have to be very sure of and you have to get a good uh, history. That points your diagnosis in around 50% of the cases maybe. And I would like to say, say that Four S are very important, the signs, like the local signs, the systemic signs that can point towards a diagnosis of lymphadenopathy. Symptoms of the patients, accompanying systems like cough, if he's having a cough with a cervical lymph node, if he's having a weight loss with a lymph node, or he's having a loss of appetite with a lymph node, all these can give a clue to the underlying lymphadenopathy cause. Then I would say the site is important, particular site can lead to a diagnosis like the supraclavicular lymph node, it can point you towards site, a certain cause, like the epitrochlear lymph nodes are important in certain, certain causes, inguinal lymph nodes, the site of drainage of the lymph node area is very important and that can provide us clue to the underlying etiology. And the last thing is the size also matters, the size is important, like in pediatrics, usually accompanied by URIs, we tend to have the cervical lymph nodes which can be enlarged. So size, according to the particular sites, inguinal lymph nodes, we have a high threshold to 2 centimeter, 2.5 centimeter. Epitrochlear, the threshold is low, 0.5 is significant. So all these are very important, I think. So to summarize, I just wanted to uh, conclude it like that. No, I, you have summarized it very well. I, I think this is in nutshell, in, in two minutes capsule, actually, I would say that you have summarized the things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Much. Sharma, sorry to interrupt you. There are a few questions. In the chat box, can you please read it out for the sir? Yes, sure, sure. I'll do that. And so, uh, uh, and one more thing, sir. Uh, can I allow Dr. Professor Dr. K. Majumdar? He has raised his hand for the question. Sure, sir. Please, Dr. Majumdar, please. Uh, uh, you can do one thing, sir. You take the two questions from the chat box, then I will ask him. Perfect. That sounds great. 
So uh, somebody has asked why pruride is in CLL, sir. Somebody has asked this question. Why there is uh, pruride is in CLL? Any not? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, so pruride is. Uh, I I think I discussed in my presentation that pruride is is not a feature of CLL. Uh, as such, garden variety of CLL. But if there is a history of pruritus, then you have to think of Richter transformation. So, so if somebody has pruritus, somebody had weight loss, somebody has fever, that means the CLL is transforming, and there you have to be careful. And in that particular situation, you might have to do either a PET CT scan uh, in CLL, which otherwise is not indicated. But in this special situation, you need to do a PET CT scan. Or you have to do a, a lymph node biopsy to rule out Richter transformation. And most of the time, if these symptoms are present, then it is likely that CLL has uh, uh, changed. At DM level, I would also say sometimes uh, rarely you can find a composite lymphoma, which we have seen few patients. So we do see you know two or three patients in a year uh, in a large volume center. So composite lymphoma is when there are two things which are present. Uh, uh, in one patient. So CLL patients obviously are not immune to development of any other malignancies. So, so, so pruritus can be, you know, this is a red hearing. So the, 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 the point which you have to understand is that if there is a pruritus, which is uncommon in CLL, you have to find out the cause of pruritus. Okay. Right, sir. Perfect. Thank you, sir. And one more question is, uh, somebody has asked for the treatment plan for young child with uh, RDD, I think it is Rosite Hoffman disease, with fever without any obstructive sign or symptom. It's, uh, this is a question asked by one of the participants. I'll repeat the question, sir. The treatment plan for a young child with uh, RDD with fever without any obstructive sign or symptom. So Rosite Hoffman, you know, it's a typical lymphoproliferative disorder and sometimes it is very difficult to treat. You know, if it is a localized kind of a thing, then many people prefer to do a surgical excision of that. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, some patients respond to steroids, some patients respond to uh, other uh, uh, drugs like uh, methotrexate. We have tried thalidomide and linalidomide in some patients, 6MP, interferon. You know, all these drugs have been tried. But again, depending upon the situation, clinical situation, you would take a decision uh, in a given, even given child. The age is not mentioned, and I must confess, I am not a pediatrician, so uh, you know exact. So what I am talking about is mostly uh, the use of the drugs in the adult population and not in the children. Yes, perfect, sir. Uh, uh, Doctor Sharma and Doctor Malhotra, with your permission, can I ask Doctor Majumdar to take his question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Can I allow him to talk? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Majumdar, you can uh, you can ask the question to sir. Uh, you need to mute and you need to unmute yourself. Dr. Majumdar, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, I think by mistake he has uh, raised his hand. He can put a question. I Fine, think you sir. can even text message or call him or something like that. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to take this question from the comment box. Sir. What are the chances of spread of carcinoma following FNAC of lymph nodes? So, uh, I'm glad that somebody asked the question. I always thought this question is asked generally asked by the patients rather than by the physician because this was a concept, uh, uh, you know, long back that if you do an FNAC, then you can spread the uh, uh, malignancy, but it is not true. Uh, and uh, I think now for the last many, many years, people do FNACs, people do biopsies, and as such, there is no spread. In any way, you know, lymphoproliferative disorders, these are systemic disorders. So it is not, you know, kind of a uh, if you are doing the FNC, you are not spreading. The blood is circulating throughout the body only. And uh, uh, the only one situation where uh, I would say that uh, people still are cautious is the testicular uh, cancers, where they say the, the FNC, they are a little cautious, but I don't think so. The, the, the 
kind of efficacy which you do you you are spreading the any kind of a malignant cells so this is uh, you know i would say incorrect or a misconception now so you can safely go for efficacy from any site yeah thank you so much i, I think dr bhavi this answers your question uh, uh, sir uh, personally i would like to uh, ask you a question uh, and uh, this might be like uh, of, might be of interest to several other people Uh, this is in sort of online consultation i am doing with you yeah sure uh, so, <laughs> so th- there are uh, like several lymph nodes like asymptomatic lymph nodes in the submandibular region uh, like from childhood and uh, some people they ask like uh, are, is there a chance for these lymph nodes to convert in a lymphomatous process how, how much duration it might take because they are persistent for years and years so is there a chance for these lymph nodes to convert into a lymphomatous process is there a possibility or something like that i, I just like to know that no i i as such i don't think so the uh, you know you rightly said at least in the kids uh, because of the recurrent uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infection so uh, so the 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 lymph the lymph nodes are quite common especially in the cervical area uh, again you know i would say uh, the history and physical examination is very very important most of the time these leaf nodes uh, they will enlarge during the uh, whenever there are uh, infections or uh, um, uh, recurrent infections and they the size will go down uh, once the patient is uh, all right and they never enlarge more than you know uh, more than a centimeter or more than 1.5 centimeter so uh, on the clinical examination if somebody has a uh, size which is growing in size so if there is you know any so what what is your worry your worry or any clinician worry is that it may not be a malignancy if it is because of any other thing like uh, autoimmune disorders you know the patient will manifest with more uh, uh, the other symptoms of autoimmune disorders like arthritis arthralgias or uh, hair loss or other thing if it is a asymptomatic kind of a thing so that means mostly it is uh, uh reactive to some infection only so reactive uh, uh, uh lymphadenopathy only and if somebody is too much worried then you can always get an fnc uh, of the lymph node done and yes. i don't i'm not sure you know the whether the presence of uh, the small lymph nodes predispose somebody to a uh, uh, lymphoma or so i at least i have not read that okay sir yeah thank you so much sir so somebody has asked uh, 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 while performing an F, uh, like the same it was a continuation of the same question like if uh, while performing fnac of uh, lymph nodes so, uh, some have concern of spreading thyroid follicular carcinomas and uh, something like that so some people have raised that concern i am not uh, sure but you are the pathologist so you can tell whether you know there i don't think so but y- yeah you can tell that <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir yeah <laughs> so we we do it in a lot of cases here and we don't uh, find uh, uh, spread in uh, follicular thyroid carcinoma at least in our experience uh, we have seen that then uh, the other question is excision biopsy is a big procedure compared to true cut biopsy but always more fruitful uh, comparing hence try to get excision biopsy wherever possible this is a comment by dr siana i think he is right uh, as you rightly pointed out that excision biopsy is always a gold standard to look the topography of the lymph node to get a larger section uh, to get a ihc whenever it's possible because in core biopsies there is a possibility that you have not hit the correct uh, uh, partial involvement by lymph nodes is common so uh, uh, so you may not hit the particular site in that cases so excision biopsy is definitely favored that is rightly said and it is a gold standard for diagnosis of a lymphadenopathy process somebody has said differential diagnosis of a suppurative lesion in submandibular lymph node in a bilateral and bilateral symmetrical in a 8 months child what are the differential diagnosis that you have to consider uh again i must confess that i am not a pediatrician i can just guess here that uh, look for the oral uh, lesions and sometimes in a 8 months old child got to think of immunodeficiencies uh, or you know some tuberculosis kind of a thing so whatever uh, suppurative lesion is there do the aspirate and uh, look in under the microscope uh, that's what i i would feel but uh, again you know i would confess that i am not a pediatrician so, so you have to ask this question to a pediatrician okay. 
Absolutely, sir. Uh, sir, one more question. Increase in size of the lymph node while on treatment of lymphoma, like uh, ALCL, uh, if any other cause possible other than disease progression, what should we consider if there is an increase in size of a lymph node while on treatment, especially in patients with ALCL? Yeah, so uh, AL... Yeah, so ALCL is, uh, you know, uh, I would uh, assume that you are talking of a T cell uh, ALCL rather than B -AL ALCL. So we know T cell lymphomas, uh, uh, you know, they are sometimes uh, not very well response to the treatment. So if there is a large, if the size is increasing, you must do a repeat uh, either an FNC or a biopsy just to see whether the patient is, uh, uh, you know, if there is a uh, ALCL still present, that means the patient is not responding to the treatment. So you have to change the treatment. Uh, and obviously this is not a good sign if somebody is not responding to the treatment. I would just share, uh, uh, you know, something here. Sometimes in tubercular lymphadenitis, once you start the patient on ATT, there is a paradoxic increase in the size of the lymph node. So there, uh, you know, you have to be careful. Sometimes, you know, the lymph node size uh, increases and this happens because of the immune activation, uh, which happens in HIV also. So there, uh, you know, uh, after the start of ATT and you just don't have to do anything, just continue the ATT and these lymph nodes after two to three months will start going down again. But in ALCL, uh, you have to change the therapy. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that detailed explanation. And uh, yes, uh, you, and if we need to do biopsy again in such cases, yes, sir has answered that question. Yes, we can do it. Uh, we can either do a FNAC or biopsy in, uh, to uh, document what is going on inside, inside the lymph node. Uh, I, I think um, uh, if there are any more comments, like uh, if you can put it in the chat box, if Dr. Uh, Professor Majumdar is there, he can ask the question by himself. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, for you. this excellent evening talk uh, uh, on uh, lymphadenopathy approach and uh, definitely uh, we, we will get an idea while examining our, our particular uh, case of lymphadenopathy presenting to our clinic and we can apply the knowledge gained from this seminar. And uh, I, I hope the participants enjoyed their evening seminar and uh, the, thank you, sir. Thank you so much once again for joining. Uh, thank you, Pankaj, sir. Thank, thank you, you Praveen, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Pankaj Malhotra. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. And thank you, Dr. Kushi. With this, we conclude this session. Thank you so much. Thank you.